Welcome to chapter one, broadcast number two. We're picking up where we left off last time on page two of the lecture outline. We'll begin by reviewing the scientific method, which is something you should be very familiar with from previous science classes you've taken. Scientists usually complete experiments in order to find solutions to problems. Take for example this plant. It's clearly unhealthy. A scientist might begin by asking, what's wrong with this plant? In order to answer this question, Scientists use a systematic approach known as the scientific method. Scientists begin to answer scientific questions by designing an experiment. We will use the candle lab as an example. In this lab, which we will be doing in class, we explore the process of a candle burning. In the lab, our objective is to determine what is actually burning when the candle is lit and what compounds are being produced from the burning process. One of the first things we need to decide on when designing the experiment is what we want to measure, what qualitative and quantitative observations we want to make. When we make qualitative observations, we are looking at things like size, color, or texture. We are making descriptive observations about the quality of the things we are looking at. Quantitative observations, on the other hand, deal with numbers. We measure things based on some sort of standard scale. For example, we might take the mass of something or record how long something takes to happen. It's also important to recognize the difference between an observation and an inference. Observations um, are data or information that can be verified by others and collected in the act of experimenting. Inferences, in contrast, are our interpretations of the observations that we've made. We infer based on what we observe. Hypotheses are also an important part of experimenting. A hypothesis is a reasonable prediction about the results that are expected in an experiment. We formulate a testable hypothesis based on what we know before an experiment begins. A hypothesis is usually written in the if-then form. In terms of the candle lab, it might be something like, if more air is present, then a candle burns longer. Or, going back to the ozone and CFCs, it might be something like, if more CFCs are present, then there will be less ozone in the atmosphere. Remember, a hypothesis must also be testable. Let's take our hypothesis about a candle from the last slide, if more air is present, then a candle burns longer, and use it to examine a few, uh, a few more important parts of an experiment. When designing our experiment, we'd want to think about how we'd need to act on our candle to test our hypothesis, what we'd actively change as experimenters in order to test our hypothesis, what we'd look at to determine the, res the response of the candle, and what elements are held constant or remain the same. Our action would be surrounding the candle with air. Remember our hypothesis was if more air was present. As experimenters, we'd actively change the amount of air around our candle. This is our independent variable. We'd be looking for changes in the time the candle burns. This is our dependent variable. Our constants, the things we didn't change, would be things like candle size, how the candle was lit, and the conditions of the room, just to name a few. After we have identified the independent and dependent variable, as well as the controls, then we begin our experiment. Based on our results, we would um, interpret whether our hypothesis was supported by the evidence collected. Depending on what occurred during the experiment, we might need to revise and retest our hypothesis. It's important not to forget that experimentation is an iterative process of testing, reevaluating, refining, and then retesting. It's not until our conclusions have been evaluated and confirmed by others that new theories are accepted. Theories explain, that's their purpose. They explain reoccurring phenomena that we observe in the world around us. A theory is defined as a broad generalization or principle of nature that is based on observation, experimentation, known facts or phenomena, and reasoning that is supported over time. Another important aspect of the experimental process is the production and use of models. Models are not only uh, used to represent something or make something more comprehensible, but can also be used to make predictions about how something works. We're going to look at three types of models here. The first is a scale model. Scale models are models that are built to resemble something in the correct proportions. 
For example, we might take something small like a molecule and make it proportionally bigger. We might also take something large like the earth or house and make it proportionally smaller. This allows us to explore something visually um, in a way that's more comprehensible. We also use drawings, photos, uh, and charts as models. For example, um, here we have three different representations of the lysozyme enzyme. Although each model is computer generated, um, it represents a different way to think about the enzyme and its interaction with sugar. Lastly, we can use graphs, simulations, mathematical models, and formulas as ways to model phenomena. For example, we might use a graph to represent the change in temperature of the Earth's surface over time. This type of model could then be used to predict future temperatures. In addition to theories, we also use laws to describe the natural world. Laws describe natural phenomena or relationships in nature. Unlike theories, laws are usually short, universally accepted, and without exception. Laws are the building blocks upon which science is built. Now that we've reviewed the scientific method, let's return to the impact of CFCs on ozone depletion. As a reminder, with decreased ozone in the atmosphere, our exposure to UV radiation is increased. This causes skin cancer, other illnesses, and impacts nature. Here are some pictures of skin cancer, also known as melanoma. The first picture, on the top left, is of benign melanoma, meaning that although it is cancerous, it's not capable of spreading. The other three pictures are of more dangerous kinds of melanoma, which run the risk of metastasizing or spreading to other parts of the body. However, your skin is not the only part of your body that can be impacted by exposure to UV radiation. Your eyes are also at risk. This is why it's important to wear sun, sunglasses, just like it's important to wear sunscreen if you're going to be in the sun for extended periods of time. Also, increased exposure to UV radiation and can generally weaken your immune system. This means that other infectious diseases or pathogens are more likely to be successful if they are contracted. Again, we aren't the only ones at risk. Plants in the food chain they support can be damaged. UV radiation can damage leaves, decrease the plant's ability to photosynthesize, and decrease the size of sprouts and leaves. By using the scientific method and through the use of models, scientists determined that there was in fact a link between the increase of CFCs in the atmosphere and the decrease of ozone. The model for how this reaction works is shown here. UV radiation is absorbed by CFC molecules, which causes a chlorine atom to be released. This is shown at the top of the diagram. This chlorine atom is highly reactive and pulls an oxygen off of the ozone molecule, leaving be behind an O2 and forming a chlorine monoxide. In the stratosphere, another free oxygen atom will interact with the chlorine monoxide and take its oxygen atom to form a new oxygen molecule. This leaves the chlorine free to take more oxygens from other ozone molecules. In this way, a single CFC molecule can destroy hundreds of thousands of ozone molecules. Once the impact of CFCs on the ozone was discovered, action was taken to prevent their use. In 1978, the use of CFC propellants and spray cans was banned in the United States. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed. Those who signed committed to a reduction in the use of CFCs and other ozone-depleting substances. Since that time, the treaty has been amended to ban CFC production after 1995 in developed countries and later in developing countries. Today, CFCs are no longer in use, and assuming that other ozone-depleting substances are also phased out, natural ozone production um, reactions should return the ozone layer to normal levels by 2050. This concludes the chapter one, uh, vodcast number two. At this point, you should have completed all of your lecture notes with the exception of Roman numeral number five. To complete this section, please see your textbook, pages 14 through 16, starting at the heading students in laboratory. This section will review lab safety and can be used to complete your yellow lecture outline.